Uh, I'll give a little bit more of a detailed introduction, if I may. Uh, I, Keith Fuller, I'm, I'm from the States, obviously, right? Uh, I, won't, I won't even attempt uh, to say anything French other than merci. We're done, that's good. Um, but my background is from uh, development. So I was a studio developer at a couple of different companies over a period of 13 years. And the majority of that time was spent in AAA development. So I started as a programmer. I was just having this chat a few moments ago. Uh, started, uh, my very first task was uh, making trash can lids flip around when you shot them. That was my first job. So I was clearly a rock star from the beginning. And um, my, my experience became one of a path of leadership in exactly this way. I was uh, seated at my desk one day and our, our studio had, had gone through a very difficult time of shipping our first cross-platform title, PlayStation, Xbox, uh, Nintendo GameCube, if anyone remembers that. And uh, we just shipped it, had an enormous amount of difficulty, and the studio management realized we needed to keep track of our people better, or at all. And uh, they said, we need someone in charge of 12 level designers. And they had no one in the company from the design department that could do this. So they actually took out the employee roster and went down every name and said, could they do it? Could they do it? And they, eventually they got to, to Keith Fuller and they said, well, Keith talks to designers. Let's put him in charge. And that was how I became a leader for the first time. No training, no experience, no description of expectations, nothing whatsoever. And I've come to find out over the past several years that's pretty much how most people get into a leadership position anywhere in the games industry. No training whatsoever, no experience. Uh, and and I, I'm just gonna come out and say that's not the best way to do these things. So uh, this is my first time speaking in, uh, in France, my first time in Paris. Uh, been very well received, thank you very much, one and all. Uh, as such, being presented with this unique speaking opportunity, uh, I feel it incumbent upon me to uh, make some sort of a brash statement and attempt to be as offensive as possible. I have a reputation as an American to uphold, so this is, this is what I'm uh, going to come out and do. Um, what I'm going to say is, uh, as a consultant, so I was in the AAA space for 11 years, and for four years or so I've been a, a leadership consultant, project management consultant. I've spoken with 100 plus companies. And I would say about five of them don't demonstrate a huge problem with leadership immediately upon me conversing with them. So uh, what that means is that anybody here from a studio of any sort, uh, it is incumbent upon you to disprove the following statement. Your company is treating its people less well than it should be and you are losing money as a result of deficient leadership at every level. So, that's my statement, and then, and then you get to respond to that. So, uh, essentially, you know, this is, what, this is what you're telling me, right? So, um, having, having accomplished stage one of, uh, of my flowchart here, uh, which, which really didn't turn out as well as I had hoped, I was really hoping everybody would leave angrily and then my wife and I could go have dinner. Clearly not the case. I'll have to go on with the presentation. There's a spectrum of responses that are going to come up when you say something wildly inflammatory about leadership in, uh, in the industry. And uh, this, is, this is kind of a, from the not healthy to healthy scale, right? And it does not have anything to do with whether or not you agree. It has to do with your attitude towards leadership and the improvement thereof. And I get any number of these on a regular basis. So this is, uh, this is something with which I'm sadly familiar. So the first thing I want to do is talk about common mistakes that we see in terms of creating leaders in the industry. And the first thing we do that's uh, absolutely incorrect in almost every single instance is promote someone. Wait, Keith, is there a language barrier here? You don't want to promote people to leadership? The reason this tends to be a bad idea, the way it's executed in most cases, is uh, we look at somebody who is a phenomenal contributor, a great artist, a great programmer, a great animator, 
and we say, you know, you are such a good programmer. We're going to make you a lead programmer. Or in my case, you're such a good programmer, we're going to make you a lead designer. So the, the, essentially what you're telling me here is, um, here are all these great programming skills that you have that, that intersect thusly with leadership skills in this tiny, tiny part in the middle, and that's what we're going to promote somebody into leadership on the basis of. Not a good decision. Uh, taking somebody who's a, a top-notch frontline contributor, saying, you're such a good programmer, we're going to make you a lead programmer. You may as well say, you're such a good programmer, we're going to make you an animator. What? That, what? That doesn't even make sense. But that's what we do in most cases. So the way in which we promote people, not a, not a good route to take. So here's another a very common mistake. And this comes not just from uh, my own experience, so working at Raven Software for 11 years. Almost all of those years, uh, there was only one route for you to take. If you wanted more uh, responsibility, better pay, advancement of any sort uh, as a programmer, uh, you're an associate programmer, you're a junior programmer, senior, and then a lead. That's all you get. If you ever want more money, more responsibility, more challenges, that's the only route for you to take. There was no way for you to advance or grow except in leadership. So there's an enormous amount of research that's been done here, and I'll just mention a book, if you haven't read it, First Break All the Rules, by a couple of researchers, Buckingham and Kaufman, they work for the Gallup Research Institute. And they uh, literally performed tens of thousands of interviews with managers across all business units, all industries across the world, and they summarized their findings in this book. And one of the main findings that they saw uh, in terms of leadership success, so what aspects of managing of leadership promote the most success or the most failures? in all of these interviews. And they said a hugely common trend is a default career path of leadership. If you want a company to fail, do that, is basically what they said. So here's another uh, very common, very common failure. Uh, assuming all leaders know what they're doing. We put lead in front of your title, so now you know everything. Well, they made me a lead designer, and I was a programmer. I'll tell you now what I told them at the time. I have no idea what I'm doing as a designer. Uh, but we assume that when we make somebody a lead. So if you're not training someone and you're not mentoring them, which was the, the case with me, then the only source of information that this new leader has is any other leaders around them who never got any training and never got any mentoring. So you tell me what kind of inbred cycle of disaster that's likely to result in. So another common mistake, uh, leaders require no accountability because they're leads, right? Well, you're a lead, so obviously you're going to be hugely responsible. You're going to do everything we need you to do. We don't need to check up on you. Even if we know you do something wrong, we don't need to do anything about it because you're a lead. Very common mistake. Similarly, uh, we don't need to give you feedback. You don't need to have meaningful reviews. Um, we don't need to talk about your development in any way, train you in any way, because you're a lead. So we'll just leave you off to do your lead things. Very common mistake. And this was one that we saw at Raven for the longest time. We had one project running concurrently. Eventually grew to 185 people, and we had three projects going. And then, as a result of economic downturns, et cetera, et cetera, we got down to two projects and then pretty much down to one. But we still had all of the leads, quote unquote, from when we had 185 people. What do you do with all of them? And when you take one that didn't really measure up, well, he still has lead on his business card, what do you do when someone finally realizes, wait, this guy isn't actually a good leader? Can you demote someone at your company? Is that possible? Can you pay them less? Can you take away responsibilities? Evidently, we couldn't at, at Raven, to be honest. So this is a very common mistake. So some misconceptions that we have. Sorry, I have to rocket through about 30 hours of material to get done in 30 minutes. 
but some, some misconceptions about the need for a superior leadership. Ours are good enough. It's a very popular one that I get. Oh, what do you do? Leadership training? Boy, you know, our industry really needs that. Not our company, though. Our company is great, but everybody else, they're a wreck. Yes, go train everyone else. Ours are good enough. No, they aren't. Wildly inflammatory statement number two. No, they aren't. How do I know that? Because your people tell me. The people at your studio are the ones that are telling me this. I can very clearly tell you where the delineation is in any given studio uh, when I speak to someone at an event, uh, because I can tell where they are in the hierarchy based on what they say about the quality of their leadership. Everybody who is at a management level and above says, no, our leaders are great. Everybody below that level, man, do we need better leaders. So the only true assessment of a leader, and I, I, I told this in my master class the other day, the only true assessment of the quality of a leader is the perception of those being led, period. Your peers may think you're doing a great job. You may think you're doing a great job. The people you're leading if they say you are not a good leader, you aren't. You're responsible for them. So the inclination of other leaders, talking about peer reviews and these sorts of things, uh, is to proclaim themselves qualified to judge other leaders because they're leads. See earlier statement, they're clearly good enough, they're leads. So let me introduce you to one of my favorite cognitive biases, which is a wonderful phrase, called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And this is something that a pair of psychologists uh, discovered through a number of research studies several years ago. And essentially, uh, there's a white paper you can read. Uh, it's, it's online, easily Googled. But essentially, what they discovered is this. Across any distribution of individuals where we ask them to perform up to some level in terms of leadership, um, solving logic problems, deciding if they're funny, anything at all, you're going to have this distribution of people that perform poorly all the way up to perform very well. There's a different distribution of how well they think they do. And that's what this graph is showing. In the bottom half of performers, so people who perform below average, everybody thinks they're above average. And in fact, until you get up into about the top 25%, nobody's even willing to overestimate or underestimate their ability. Everybody overestimates their ability until you get to the top quarter of people that are involved. And they underestimate themselves. This is a well understood cognitive bias and you can see this elsewhere. And basically, uh, a friend of mine, Mike Acton, who is a bit more brash than I am, uh, used this in a talk of his and said, yeah, they're too stupid to know they're stupid. It's a little unfair. That's, that's an unfair distillation of psychological findings, but that's essentially what, what they're saying. So that's, that's the problem with, with ours are good enough. Another popular misconception here, well, experienced leaders are clearly good leaders, right? If they, well, this guy's been here for 10 years. He's got to be an amazing lead, right? No, there are two pretty good reasons. Why. First of all, that's bunk. It's, it's, a, it's a shoddy attempt at, at correlation. Uh, but second of all, it is very possible to be consistently bad. I've worked for people that were consistently bad over many years. Just because you have been a leader for a long time doesn't mean you're good by default. The second point I'd, I'd want to make about this is the use of this word, good. Right? No, there are experienced leaders are good leaders. Not enough. We want excellent leaders because game developers deserve the best leadership, full stop. I'm going to tone down the ranting. Sorry, it's a small room. I have a microphone. Um, past success. Well, we've shipped games and they've, they've sold units, right? Clearly, we don't need to improve anything. We don't need to change how we do things at all because we've been doing this for years. Why do we need to change anything? Why do we need to train anybody or develop any skills or hire better? We've been in business for a long time. Why do we need to change? Ah, so you're, sh you're still shipping on floppies then. Okay, that's fantastic. 
Looking around the room, does everyone remember floppy disks? Am I the only person? Okay, three hands went up. You, okay. When, when you use Windows next and you hit the save button, ask yourself why that icon looks the way it does. And then, and then we'll come back to this. Okay, so no need for improvement because we've been doing this for years. We don't have the resources to address it. It's a, it's a great idea, Keith. Sure, we'd love to have great leaders. Everybody would. We don't have the time or the money for any of this training nonsense. Right? This, is, uh, this is one that I get quite often as well. And um, I guess you know, what I'm going to do here is uh, ask for a little bit of kindness. I have a number of friends that work at Ubisoft, various locations around the world. I have nothing against them or the company, especially not the 100,000 Ubisoft developers in this nation. So this is not an attack of any sort. This is merely making a correlation of points that were clearly advertised in the media. So we have here a company that said we couldn't put female models in our game because it's too much work, too many resources. We can't do it. This is the company that paid one developer for two years to make a building. Couldn't put a female model in the game. So when we're talking about things like time and money, no, it's a matter of priorities. If you care enough, you'll do something about it. So the last, uh, the last point that I'll make on this, because this is fun, it's audience participation, and Americans love this sort of thing. Uh, so if you own or, or have ever owned a car, raise your hand, raise your hand. Okay, excellent, Actually, now keep them up, keep them up, it's part of the exercise, keep your hands up, you owned a car, this will just take a minute. Okay, so if after you made your payment for the car, you had no money left for petrol or oil changes whatsoever, then you can, uh, you can keep your hand up, but everyone else put them down. If you still had any money for, for petrol, any money at all for oil changes, then you put, okay. Notice how no one has their hand up anymore, right? Nobody just bought a car with every last penny they ever earned, drove it till it ran out of fuel, and left it on the side of the road as a paperweight. Because you know it takes resources to keep the thing running. Okay, so what can you do about it? Assuming that we have any level of agreement with you, Keith, with all of this ranting of yours, what can we do about it? Okay, the first thing that we want to talk about is objectively assessing things. So employee engagement. This is a concept that doesn't get a lot of play in the games industry, but has been thoroughly researched for decades in almost every other industry. Employee engagement is the emotional investment of your developers how attached they are to their project, their team, their company, okay, that's their engagement level. And it positively impacts, proven to positively impact things like employee retention, health, morale, productivity, uh, workplace injuries. So everybody here who works at a game studio and you're sick and tired of one forklift accident after another, this will help with that. So employee engagement is something you need an objective assessment of. How are we doing in providing a work environment where people care? There are tools that exist. Use them. These are just aspects of employee engagement. Your, how do you feel about your immediate supervisor? Uh, are, you, uh, are you valued for your contribution? These are aspects of employee engagement. So get an objective assessment of that. And accept that every aspect of employee engagement is the responsibility of leadership, period. Every one of those things, the health and well-being of your workers, how they feel about your company values, do they trust the leadership of the company, every one of those is a leadership issue. That's nobody else's fault if those are having problems. We talked about making the time, right? Uh, we talked about resources. Oh, we don't have it. We, we can't do it. Uh, let me tell you about these guys. Now, I don't know them personally. Hello, games. I get the impression this is a smallish group. Um, this picture in the background, you can't really see it overly well, is what their offices looked like in January of this year, underwater. Everything they had, totally gone. Hardware, software, everything. They're working on this fabulous game called No Man's Sky, and uh, the entire office was wrecked, flooded. 
Six months later, they won these three awards at E3 for the project that was previously under three meters of water. How, how did they do that when they really didn't have the resources of a large company? They cared. They, they made the time to keep working on the game. They found a way to do it. So you can mentor and teach people internally regardless of the size of your team. You don't have to go out and find pricey external resources. Somebody at your company knows more about critical things than somebody else. Have them teach. Do it over lunch. Um, make something fun happen over the weekend, after hours. There are any number of ways that you can do this without spending a ton of money. Mentor and teach internally. So one time CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt, I think he's executive chairman of the board or something now. He said, everybody needs a coach. I have a coach. Because the one thing that nobody is as good at as they think is knowing what other people think about them. Everybody needs a coach. CEO of Google says that, I'll listen. So examining employee retention trends. Why do people stay? Why do they leave? This is something you can do at any size of your company. A friend of mine, Josh Nilsson, is CEO of Eastside Games in Vancouver, British Columbia. So west coast of Canada. He talks about the effort that they go to to analyze why people leave the company. Did they come because, uh, because they were recommended by a certain person? or because they answered this ad, or they saw us on the street, or why did they come, why did they leave? Analyze these trends. Uh, he gave a, an IGDA uh, webinar on this a while back. You can look it up on YouTube. I've, I've got a link in a bit. Uh, a friend of mine at Bioware Montreal, pretty much the opposite of an indie studio, uh, was saying similar things at uh, Siege 2014 in, in uh, Atlanta, a convention earlier in the summer. Uh, exploring employee retention trends. Well, why do people leave, why do they stay? If I, had, uh, if I had a nickel for every time I, somebody said, oh, well, my door is always open, thinking that that meant that their leadership is amazing, you need to be active and not just passive as a leader. It's not enough to say, oh, you can come to me anytime you want. No, you go to them. There's a, an HR director at a 200-person studio I know of. She has a one-on-one -on -one meeting with every employee at least once a year. So that's 50 hours of her time, at least, every year. And she, these aren't her direct reports, she just wants to make an effort to reach out and find out what's going on with them. She's active, not just passive. Although I'm sure her door is also always open. Being explicit about what's important and not just assuming everybody knows is very important. So I'll give you an example. How do you onboard somebody at your company? Which is to say, great, they, uh, we extended them a contract, or we said, would you like a job? They said yes, and now they're here on the first day. What do you do? Even if it's a distributed team, right? They're working in their, their pajamas in their living room. What do you do to make this person part of the company? Do you just wing it? Uh, I'll, I'll uh, introduce them to everybody with an email. Done. Be explicit about what they need. What do they need to know? What, uh, what are your expectations of them? Write it down. Make it a document instead of just kind of an oral tradition and word of mouth. Being explicit about the things that are, that are critical to your, your organization. So the last thing I mentioned for, for impact is company values. I probably talked about this. So I had an, uh, an eight-hour class earlier this week. Probably 30 of those eight hours were spent talking about company values. The, uh, the most important thing that I would say about this is your company has a culture. Whether you want one or not, whether you try to create one or just let it happen, your company has a culture. And your values are going to be a description of what that culture is. And there may well be a distinction between the values you put on the website and the values that actually represent what happens in the company. Those may well be two different sets of things. What you put on the uh, ourcompanyname.com slash jobs page 
our values are fun and passionate and awesome, may well be different from what you see in the company. And the difference between your stated values and how you actually act is called integrity. So I, I want to thank you guys for listening to uh, a rocket ride through a number of leadership aspects. Uh, and, and these are just some of the resources that I mentioned throughout the talk. Uh, I, I realize it's a little difficult to actually click on these, but if you need the URLs, those are available as well. Uh, and feel free to reach out to me in any number of these ways. Uh, I am always happy to talk to anyone and everyone about leadership. So thank you for your time. I'd like to take this opportunity to mention that those slides are going to be made available uh, right after this session, actually online, uh, in the Game Connection on the Game Connection website. Uh, do you guys have any question? I have one, actually, just to, to warm it up. Please. Uh, I was wondering because I'm also a manager of a small company, and uh, I tend to believe that uh, we are way below average when it comes to leadership. And I wanted to, you know, how how can can a, a manager or a, a CEO Evaluate the company uh, leadership management globally. How can the CEO evaluate the company from yeah, a well, leadership perspective? What is the perspective? best way to do that? I mean, how could you face the reality of your lax <laughs> in management? So there's a there's a concept in HR circles of a 360 review, right? Uh, and essentially, what that means is a, a standard review in in performance terms or or what have you. Your boss comes in once a year and tells you how you're doing. That's essentially it. Uh, and in many of my performance reviews, it was a complete surprise to me uh, what that review was going to entail because they, they like surprising you in these reviews. But that's a one direction review. So the idea behind a 360 is you're getting a full circle of reviews of how somebody's performed. Yes, your boss will talk to you, but you'll also hear from peers, other people, a similar situation in your organization, and from the people who report to you. It's kind of tricky because you're the boss, how are you going to get an objective assessment from those people, right? Hi, I'm the person that could fire you in a heartbeat. How do you think I'm doing? Surprisingly well, Pierre, yeah, right? I mean, what are they going to say? Um, but a method that I used at a, at, when I was at Raven, and it, it apparently stunned the organization that I asked for a 360 review, um, is find a third party who's willing to provide this kind of double blind anonymity. So I, I went to, to Michael and I said, Michael, I'm going to ask all of my people to send you a document explaining how they think I'm doing. And then I want you to rewrite that and just kind of take some of the big bullet points and then you email that to me. So I don't directly see what each person says, but I still get the impact from them, from their thoughts. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. But again, uh, you don't know where you are. You, you, you had these four quarters, the first quarter, the second quarter. It, people tend to be NAP anyway uh, with the management. Uh, to managers tend to be NAP from the people that would, that would, who are working for them and the other way around. They tend to expect more. So how do you know you are below average or above average say, in terms of, of global management? Yeah, I, see, I got your point. Makes sense. Oh, okay. So in, in, in terms of, well, they may think you're doing a great job, but what if they've never had a boss before yeah. and you're actually terrible? Yeah. Okay, what if, that, <laughs> what if I, that's I know, the case? <laughs> So, so that's one of the reasons that I stressed the use of the word objective mm -hmm. earlier. So there are obviously many companies out there in the world that make a living on providing those sorts of assessments, mm -hmm. right? Where you can just go hire a company to come in and they will put it in terms of other people in your industry, other people in your salary range or the size of your company and say, well, you're in the top 20% of da 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 and, and can give you some objective data comparing you to other organizations, hopefully similar to yours. So that's another route as well, which would hopefully solve the problem of these people have potentially no idea how to evaluate a leader. I uh, like very much a double, double blind idea. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> it's a little easier to just find a friend and have them send the emails. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do that. Cheaper too, right? <laughs> Probably. Any other question, yes? Uh, more of a comment. When I was working at Microsoft, what you were saying was exactly happening. Uh, if you're a good programmer, you got promoted to leader, and they went through a cycle of really bad leaders. Then they went through a cycle. This of, is my surprised face. By yeah. The way. Then they went through a cycle of losing people because they did not want to become managers. People sandbagging, 
so they wouldn't get promoted. And they finally came up with this thing that they called the individual contributor. And you actually could make the same money and just be a programmer, just be an artist. And it made a huge difference because they had people wanting to stay then. And they're like, you know, I thought I was going to have to leave because I wanted to be manager. And I didn't want to manage. I just want to code. Or right. I'm not good at being a manager and I know it. And so that's exactly what happened. And, and, and one of the big things is they started losing people. That was the big clue. Yeah. Bad, bad, badly managed projects. And then why is everyone leaving? And then they asked. And yeah. No and, and probably there are a couple of reasons why there were many people leaving. One of which is some of them didn't want to be a leader, right? The other reason is we now have a bunch of crummy leaders and people don't want to work for them anymore, right? So both of those come from a default career path of leadership. And that's something they undertook fixing at Raven a few years before I left the company was they created... Uh, I think they essentially it was subject matter experts, right? So you have a leadership path. You also have, uh, I think they called it a, a studio developer path. So you are going towards being a studio expert in programming, art, VFX. So you had something to do other than progress towards being a lead. What, what is funny in that case, I mean, you got the experts and you got the managers, but the funny thing that the managers are supposed to lead, but the experts are named lead. Lead themselves, lead developer, lead uh, designer. Right. That's weird. Anyway. And, and I, were, I have a client, uh, about a 60-person company in Chicago, where I think the CEO would, uh, he would do anything before he would give people titles. Hates the idea of people. You can be a programmer. That's great. You could even be a really experienced programmer. We are not going to give you a business card that says lead programmer or senior programmer. Because he, his experience, I think he came from EA originally. Um, his experience is that nothing good comes from giving people titles. Because there's this assumption of, well, if you're a lead or even a senior, you're morally superior to an associate programmer. Right? I mean, that's the assumption with titles. So he just did away with them completely. That's, that's a solution, I guess. Just give numbers? What's that? You number one, you number two. You yeah, that's right, programmer number eight. That's it. I think they keep names. I think names are still names used. Are Titles, not so much. <laughs> Any other question? Yes, not. Thank you very much, Keith. Oh, thank you.